Okay, so hello everyone and welcome to BrainMap. This seminar series is co-sponsored by the P41 funded Center for Mesoscale Mapping housed in the Martino Center. It's my huge pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Professor Penny Gowland. Professor Garland is the Associate Director of Sir Peter Mansfield Imaging Center University at Nottingham. She had made pivotal contributions in quantitative MRI, and her most recent contributions are in body imaging. Professor Garland initially did her PhD in quantitative MRI at the Institute of Cancer Research in the 1980s. She then came to Nottingham to work with Peter Mansfield on the development and exploitation of EPI in the 1990s. And this led to her interest in using high-speed MRI to study dynamic processes. She have worked in neuroscience and neurology to study the substantial negra in Parkinson's disease, and also worked substantially in the field of GI and developed methods that enabled groundbreaking study of undisturbed GI function in health and disease. Penny also discovered a new physiological phenomenon, the placental pump, and, it, and undertook a series of investigations into the safety of MRI. I would just like to remind the audience to please address any question you have using the Q&A box or just raise your hand. Professor Garland, thank you so much for coming here today. The, the virtual stage is all yours. Thank you very much. Thank you for that kind introduction. Um, so I'm going to take you out of your comfort zones of the brain into the body today. I'm sorry about that. There are a couple of brain images tucked in somewhere. But I hope I'm going to convince you that body imaging is uh, a very exciting frontier for MR. So as you know, I was just hearing about how you're using CES to look at um, uh, apoptosis in cancer. So as you know, MR is not just an imaging technique, it's a window into physiology and biochemistry. It allows us to do safe, non-invasive, repeatable measurements for experimental medicine and experimental biosciences. And that's how I use MR probably partly because I'm based in a physics department, so we're less focused on clinical applications, direct clinical applications. So we use MRI to study dynamic responses to physiological challenges across organs. And so these physiological challenges can be a wide range of things, for instance, exercise or diet, as I'm going to show. And we can do MR spectroscopy for, as we say, biochemistry without the needles by looking at what's going on within reason, at least at some biochemistry within the tissues, as you know, but what I'm going to focus on to some extent today is developments at very low and very high field. So the current paradigm, and I'm going to focus quite a lot on GI because, um, partly because I could put a good story together on that, um, but the current paradigm for many conditions is a, a, a litany of tests. Patients will go under, undergo a range of tests. So for instance, if you have some kind of GI functional disorder, that's um, sort of something like... Um, irritable bowel disease or uh, inflammatory bowel disease. You'll have, for instance, um, gamma scintigraphy tests where you might look at gastric emptying, you might be dual, dual uh, isotope tests, you might have a barium enema, you might have intubation, and clearly many of these tests are quite uh, just perturbating the normal physiology. You know, having a tube um, stuck up your nose to measure your gastric function is not the most pleasant of things. So the concept that we have at Nottingham, and actually the term and, and the idea really was devised by Luca Marciani, more of him later, was the idea of a one-stop shop for functional physiology, where MRI in a single measure can uh, answer a lot of these questions, make a lot of these measurements. And we do studies which are comprehensive. So we do have fasted subjects or fed subjects, depending on the study, that have test meals, they have blood tests, they have uh, psychological tests, We'll do a whole days of studies, um, studies that can go on eight hours potentially. And of course we we'll do a comprehensive MR protocol. And also we aim sometimes to find studies that just make a measurement at one time point to allow us to translate these measurements to clinic. So these are some of the measurements we make in the stomach. Um, this was one of the earliest studies we did. This is a half Tesla EPI scan of the stomach. And there's a the stomach there. Um, interestingly, in this study, we were looking at the effects of viscosity on satiety. So how thick the meal is on how full you felt. And to me, as a physicist, it was absolutely astonishing that if you ask people, how full do you feel? And you measure the volume of the stomach for a non-nutrient meal, just a gel, the, 
the graph is absolutely linear, you know, asking a range of people, asking how full they felt. I was, I was blown away that this psychology could be so good at measuring um, these, these uh, physical parameters. And interesting, if it's a, it's a nutrient meal, then that function becomes nonlinear, but in a controlled manner. Um, we can look at the uh, gastric uh, contractions. Um, we can look at the, we can use uh, tagging to look at the flow. And you can see here the flow, this is the stomach, I should say. Uh, here's the stomach, here's the heart, here's the liver. In this case, you can see the flow in the stomach by the movement of the tags. I'm sure you're aware of that. And you can see that the flow is going both ways. So it's not just going down out of the stomach. What's actually happening here is the flow is being pushed towards, the contents are being pushed towards the pylorus, the, the valve at the end of the stomach, and then pushed back. So you've got retropulsion, which leads to grinding in the stomach or emulsification in the stomach. So one of the reasons I love doing this is because it's physics in action. You can actually um, measure shear rates and measure flow rates in here and look at the, the breakdown of the materials and emulsification, the forces going into emulsification of fat. Here we're looking at beads being uh, passed through the pylorus and broken up in the pylorus. There's a bead there and there's beads in the, uh, in the coronal plane here. One of the things we spent a lot of time on is looking at layering in the stomach. And I'm going to come back to this right at the end, because of course, all these images were done with people lying flat horizontally. And you can see the fat layering on top of the stomach. Um, this is a fat image, a water image, and you can see the fat on top of the water layer there. Um, clearly, that determines how the fat leaves the stomach. And it turns out that if the fat leaves the stomach first, it'll stop your gastric emptying. And if it leaves at the end, just water will empty out and then the fat will leave. And so by emulsifying the fat into the meal, you can control how full you feel. So this is key information, both for food manufacturers and for controlling appetite. And the message is eat soup, because that makes you feel fuller. Um, oops, right. We don't just have to work in the stomach, so on down. These are beads that uh, Luca has manufactured, has, has worked to make with a manufacturer to create, to look, let us look at the uh, transit through the gut, because you'll turn to the X-ray uh, pills, which are not um, suitable, certainly in children. We can look at the movement of colon, again, trans, uh, tagging in the colon, and we can look at the small bowel. And um, this movement of the small bowel is actually a very useful measurement in Crohn's disease and many other conditions, and we'll come back to that. Actually, I just want to stop at this image. This, these are the house stars. I'm going to come back to them later, these little lines in the colon. You, you're, you're probably familiar with this little picture of the colon as a um, thing with wobbly edges. And if you look at the contents of the colon moving here, you'll see they seem to be move, it means it's moving up and down in the middle, but not at the edges. The edges are being held stationary by the house strata. And that's almost certainly related to the microbiome, which is so important in the brain and uh, in the rest of the body for, because the microbiome makes quite a significant fraction of your, your material in your body. It's, uh, it's in a symbiotic relationship with your body. And we know it has quite a big impact on your um, sense of satiety and other aspects of your physiology. And it looks like the way the, these house jars are there is to stop the microbiome being di uh, disturbed during its formation. So I'm not gonna go through all the things we can measure in the gut or related to the gut, but um, as I said, a one-stop shop. So, you know, it's not just the GI function, but we can measure uh, how things are distributed in the small bowel. We can look at the colon. We can also look at gut wall inflammation in Crohn's disease um, or in, in not Crohn's disease um, in response to, for instance, uh, um, challenges like paracetamol. Uh, fat distribution, um, lymph nodes in inflammation and gut liver function, which I'll talk about later. And of course, the gut brain axis, so fMRI of the brain in relationship to the um, gut. And in fact, at the moment, we're doing a study looking at the permeability of the blood the brain CSF function compared to the blood uh, the gut blood um, barrier. So here, here are two studies. Um, this is one looking at whole gut transit in um, uh, patients with irritable bowel syndrome with constipation and not with constipation just showing that transit is increased in patients with constipation. Now that may seem obvious to you. Uh, the transit times are longer. The really interesting thing that we've been doing here is looking at the motility of the colon, how the colon moves, because um, you might assume that there's less motility in constipation, but it turns out there's 
basically two types of constipation, one with increased motility and one with deranged, sorry, one with reduced uh, wall, gut wall peristalsis and one with deranged peristalsis. And clearly, if you're going to give patients drugs to increase their peristalsis, if their peristalsis is deranged, you're probably not going to be doing any good. So this is a new way of, well, first of all, new, new um, understanding, which didn't come from us, that understanding came from a, a group in Australia using intubation, where we can provide a non-invasive marker to separate those two groups. Small bowel water was something we did very early on with EPI, uh, basically just looking at the T2, the, the, the long T2 signals in the small bowel, which shone out on the EPI scans where everything else was, you know, black at, uh, in the body at uh, even at half Tesla. <clears throat> and you can see after a drink, the water goes through into the small bowel and then gradually disappears away. And in this case, we were looking at the different effects of different um, sugars. Uh, FODMAPs are a, a some ways a uh, big issue in the popular culture, but also in uh, the nutrition culture. FODMAPs are um, um, uh, um, uh, sugars that are um, osmotically active and they actually change the microbiome and change the effects of gas and so on in the gut. And so they can, some people can find them extremely um, disturbing to their GI function. And this was looking at how combining FODMAPs with other sugars might actually improve their function, reduce their effects, I suppose. This is a study of um, Crohn's disease patients. And we're not looking at small bowel here, we're looking at fistulas um, in the uh, body wall from the bowel into the body wall. So truly unpleasant um, condition for the patients. And we're looking at the comparison of um, MT, DWI, and DCE, contrast enhanced. So at the moment, these patients are only scanned at one and a half Tesla. I've no idea, well, in the UK, they're only scanned at one and a half Tesla. Um, and the question was whether 3T, MR, DWI, or MT could actually replace um, contrast enhanced MRI. And in an, an initial study, we certainly find a, a relationship between the MTR at 3T and the K trans measures at 1.5T as a potential way of improving the management of these patients because um, the question is whether you give drugs or surgery in these cases. Um, and sim similar patient groups. So when we started doing this work, um, we largely focused on patients with absolutely um, only bowel disorders. What has become clear over the years is that the bowel is a problem in many other disorders. And this is an example in CF, cystic fibrosis, I should say. So in cystic fibrosis, uh, the primary um, target for treatment is the lung because it's lung disease that is, leads to mortality. Um, and of course, there's been a new drug that's just come out for cystic fibrosis, which is hopefully transforming the situation for patients with this disease. But the, the way that cystic fibrosis damages the lungs is by changes to the mucus. And so not surprisingly, um, if you ask a cystic fibrosis patient, what's the most annoying thing about the disease after the lungs, which thing that you know makes them ill, they'll say the thing that really inconveniences them is their GI disorders that they get, gastric and intestinal disorders. And um, uh, well, this maybe is not working, but this is um, a normal colon um, and it's actually, this one is sagittal and this is coronal. It's not quite a good comparison anyhow. If you see here, these are the house straws I was talking about before. And you can see that the material is sort of squeezing through those house straws and not opening them up properly. And um, this, with other images, we can see strands of mucus. It would seem to be very, very thick mucus that's stuck in this gut wall, stopping the colon here operating properly. And we've also looked at the small bowel water after meals, this is controlled patients and CF patients. So you can see much larger water content in the gut after the meal than in the CF patients and the controls. Um, we could hypothesize that's due to reduced absorption. Um, that's, that's a hypothesis to be proven. So completely switching target now from MRI to MRS. As I say, we want a comprehensive study. So um, many uh, um, liver disorders are lead to um, bowel, well, liver disease leads to problems with the bowel and nutrition, nutrition problems um, lead to problems with the liver. So the, the gastroenterology includes the liver and the gut. 
So in this case, we've used, and this is a 3T study using um, hepatic ATP study, a study of hepatic ATP with 31P spectroscopy of the liver, um, looking at the relationship between ATP after time after a fructose drink, because it's known that fructose can drop um, hepatic ATP. And we looked at the relationship between the recovery of ATP, or well, the loss of ATP, I should say, and BMI and found that the um, time to minimum was greater in patients with high BMI. Um, and it would appear that high BMI is linked to less effective hepatic recovery of ATP, which fits with um, uh, poor liver function in patients with um, NAFLD, that's fatty liver disease. And we're also using carbon-13 labelled studies to look at uh, antioxidants in the liver. So the antioxidants in the liver li link with the ATP recovery, so liver function. And in this case, we're looking at we're giving carbon-13 labelled glycine and doing a very, very, very simple pulse acquire sequence over the liver because it's very low signals. So it's just a coil over the liver, collect all the signal we can from it in an FID, uh, make this fit, um, create the spectra here and look at the glycine turn up in the spectrum over time and how that's converted to glutathione. And we can see the glutathione um, creation over time in this experiment. Um, we've just finished, finished this and uh, it's taken the whole of lockdown to get the blood glycine measurements um, analyzed by a, a different lab and uh, it's being fitted now. So hopefully we're about to publish that and we'll be able to see if there's any differences in this case, um, again, with a paracetamol challenge. So now I'm going to go on to talk about MRI of the abdomen at 7T. So I'm going to do 7T and later on I'm going to do 0.5T. As I'm certain you're fully aware in your lab, um, the major problem with 7T imaging is the RF dropout. And in the body, well, this is at 3T. So um, as um, has been said, I actually do quite a lot of work imaging the fetus and at 3T, in a large fetus with a lot of fluid, you get very big holes potentially in the uh, signal. At 70, you get these bands. And um, obviously the way to resolve this is to use RF shimming with multi-channel coils. Um, the bands can be relatively controlled and they can be very much just across a single plane. If you're lucky, you can get a good image if you go behind the line, um, but sometimes they're very destructive depending on the size of the patient. On the volunteer. So um, in common, I think with most people doing 70 body imaging, um, we have a uh, coil from um, a multi-channel dipole array coil, and this is the, where one is from uh, Utrecht. Um, the problem we have with it is it's, uh, well, it's the third eight channel transmit, 32 channel receive loops on the surfaces, the, these dipoles. The problem we have with it is the um, SAR limits are set by the manufacturer, well, by the Philips, the manufacturer of the scanner, um, which really limits our ability to do many things very well with this scanner at the moment, with this coil at the moment. It's, we can do stuff, but uh, we'd like to be able to do more. So we've been looking at the modeling to try and improve the SAR um, limits. I, I, I suppose I'm going to tell a story. I'm not sure the answer to it is so great at the moment in terms of solving that particular problem. But the first problem we had is these coils, these dipoles have um, <coughs> meanders in them. <coughs> and uh, the coil which we have are placed around the person is not placed in a nice straight line like this. It could be um, tilted around the patient, tipped around the patient, curved around the patient, meaning that these meanders are not um, aligned with the grids in the simulation software. So um, Paul Glover and Stephen Borden have come up with an approach um, to uh, I've missed their names of this, this slide now. Paul Glover and Stephen Borden have done this work and they've come up with an approach to model these, these dipoles as wires with inductors in them. And that allows us to tilt them. Now we are getting slightly higher um, levels, but we actually think that may be because of <coughs> improved modeling in the first place. But it does allow us to tilt the coils right around the person, which is much more realistic to the model than this layout here. And in particular, close to the arms, we sometimes get much bigger effects when the core is close to the arms. <clears throat> um, as you'll see here, as becomes a thread here, in fact, it turns out all the peak SARs, which is what we're really worried about, are near the surface. And so that's the battle we're fighting. Um, 
so we've looked at simplifying the models. Um, we've considered, you know, which different tissues you can replace in the models, and um, considering the full model, including all the aspects of the tissues as far as we could reasonably do it, and then down to replacing the organs and bone as muscle. And it largely doesn't make a huge amount of difference. The key thing that I've not shown here is that basically, if you change the skin into muscle, it really falls apart. So the, the take home message is we needed to include the skin in this to get a decent um, <coughs> model. Now, the problem with the skin actually is it's actually quite hard to be certain that we're modeling it right, even when we think we're doing our best, because the way the models uh, um, uh, um, characterize the tissues, the way you can actually put this, this grid of tissue, um, this, the tissue grid into the model um, uh, gridding process is, is not uh, exact. And so it's quite hard to be certain even that's right, but it's certainly the case if you take the skin off, the models aren't uh, consistent. <clears throat> so now we've looked at the effect of respiration um, and shown that respiration makes um, marginal changes in the coil, uh, in the field, that we get. And then we looked at the effect of repositioning because of course we can in principle uh, model the SAR per individual. And that's what's been proposed and was what we had expected to do. We were anticipating what we're going to do is get an MRI scan of a person in the simulation, wrap the coil around the person, um, simulate the SARs and therefore set our own limits. But what we did was we repositioned the coil in the simulation in the way that would be realistic between going between an MR scan at 3T to an MR scan at 7T, um, or even between breathing and just generally shuffling around in the coil. And we found that the differences were reasonably large. And this is the same person, same um, model, just moved the coil slightly, very slightly on the person. And in one case, we got, you know, the, the underlying red is the average of over. So this, these, these are simulations of all the different possible combinations of phases or thousand possible combinations of phases on these coil elements. And you can see quite a big variation between individuals in the, in the values of SAR received. So uh, peak SAR received. So it's not easy to just go with, um, oh, we'll, we'll model it on an individual basis. We need to go further to improve this. Um, and allow us to go higher in peak um, power from the coil. But we still managed to get some uh, results at um, 70. So we've been doing angiography because um, many people have done angiography. This is from um, uh, Metzger. Metzger. Um, and the reason for doing this is clearly because at 70, the T1s are longer, angiography works well. Um, we've been using it to look at the very small peripheral vessels which are affected in acute in, uh, kidney injury. We were using multi-echo data because of the combination of needing to have long, SA, long TRs to minimize the SAR, high flip angles, which we had to optimize on each individual subject based on the B1 map, um, allow for inflow, allow for readout. We ended up with having quite a long TR. So we collected multiple echoes and summed them to try and get back some signal from that long TR. Um, and, uh, we think it's reasonable to say that you can see more peripheral vessels at 7T than at 3T using the 7T body coil. And the liver similarly produces nice um, uh, um, angiogra angiography. And in the liver, it's interesting to look at the, ar the uh, arterial and venous supplies to the, li the liver. Um, and we've measured T2 star, as you might expect, it's different in the liver at 3T and 7T. But I think the real place for 7T in the abdomen will actually be, of course, in spectroscopy. So one thing um, that we've been looking at is the difference between subcut well, between difference in uh, subcutaneous and visceral spectroscopy, uh, a fat spectroscopy, um, looking at the different peaks in the fat and trying to calculate the saturation index of the fat. And um, what we've actually found is not much difference in the saturation index of the fat between these tissues and the people we've looked at so far, and the groups we've looked at so far, which was not entire, entirely what we expected. So we're doing uh, this more because other people have reported this, but in our, in our work, we haven't seen a big difference at this stage. Um, but this is something we want to look at more in patients with liver disease. The other thing you can do at 3T, but you can do better at 7T is look at the uh, intramyocellular and extramyocellular lipids. So 
then in the fat in muscle uh, is either inside the cells or around the cells. And because of the um, geometry in the 7T uh, scanner, horizontal bore 7T scanner, if the muscles are lined along the, the, the cord, uh, along the scanner, you get this splitting of the peak by the EMCL and IMCL because of the geometry of the fat and the susceptibility effects around the fat. This um, splitting, I mean, it's quite hard to fit at 7T, it's very hard to fit at 3T, but you can fit it at 7T if you can get good line width, which you, which you can. Um, and it's very keenly uh, sought marker by the muscle physiologists because IMCL intramycellular lipids is a key energy supply for the muscle. And so then it's very hard to actually even separate some biopsies so that they're quite excited by this measurement. Um, and we're actually using this quite a lot at the moment. So IMCL is a marker of insulin sensitivity and we combine it with combination in com uh, combining with measurements of carnitine at 7T and also 3T ATP flux rates. The moment we don't do phosphorus at 7T, we only do um, uh, proton and carbon 13. The other thing, um, going back to the discussion I had before this meeting, is we we do CES. We've been doing CES for some time at 7T, and as you know, uh, for well, it's a big win for 7T. So we're now trying to do it in the body. Um, I'm actually doing quite a lot of work looking at collagen uh, um, spectroscopy uh, cest as a marker of um, fibrosis. And we're working at 7T, but with an aim to transfer that to 3T, at least to try and get some markers at 3T of collagen, because uh, it's 3T, we want to look at bowel wall and things like that. It's probably better at 3T than at 7T. But we've also been looking at glycocest as a potential alternative to 13C, and other groups have been doing this in the last couple of years. So we're using, again, from Utrecht, the semi-continuous wave saturation, where you use the eight channels in pairs um, to alternately uh, saturate, to try and maintain a somewhat continuous wave saturation. And you need to be careful of the shimming there to try and ensure you're looking at an ROI where the saturation is reasonably continuous between the two channels, oh, two pairs of channels. Uh, sets of channels. Um, and these are um, spectra from a glycogen phantom. Um, and this is in vivo. And uh, you can see it, this is after eating a lot of pizza and orange juice to try and change the glycogen in the liver after fasting and then eating uh, pizza and orange juice. And we um, uh, suspect, and this is the glycogen change here, this is where we expected it. But this indicates um, the problem, uh, respiration. CEST is very sensitive to B1 and it's very sensitive to B0. And so making sure we can make these measurements without B0 effects is actually quite hard. So this was all respiratory gated. So it's actually quite a difficult experiment for the subject. Um, so we did a study in a few subjects looking over uh, time, looking at four and uh, two and four hours at the seismic peak. And we didn't just see glycogen over here. We also think we saw an NOE response. Um, actually, other people have recently done the same thing. See, also seen this NOE signal, which seems to be related to the glycogen signal. And finally, uh, this is not my work. This work's Richard Botel's work with uh, Damien and Cocking. And um, so to add to the multinuclear um, zoo, we've, we've got an osseum now, we're doing, he's doing deuterium. And so they've fortunately been able to piggyback on the muscle physiologists who are doing deuterium loading studies for, for um, isotope tracer techniques, not in involving NMR. And they've done a loading, D2O loading study. Um, they can see the loading in D2O in the brain. They can measure T2 in the brain. Um, they can uh, measure T2 in the lipids. And then they can look at the loading time course. So this is the loading time course here in the spectroscopy in a um, CSI study. So next, I'm going to go to the complete other end of the spectrum. So I have to be honest, the 70 project has sort of um, slightly stalled during the uh, lockdown because it was, we had quite a lot of troubles with the hardware before we started uh, lockdown, just as we were starting lockdown. And so it's just getting back up and running and we're doing the, um, the glycogen studies, the, the CES studies now. 
in the meantime, we had already had installed a half Tesla uh, scanner. I'm going to show you more about it in a minute. Um, and we had it upgraded just as lockdown was ending. So right, right now, I'm somewhat focused at Lowfield. This image uh, is a half Tesla scan, EPI scan of the stomach from, I don't know, 1990. And um, what this image shows you is that, first of all, EPI works in the body. And secondly, um, half Tesla can give you extremely important information. So um, for me, this is back to the future. And we are not doing uh, 0.5 teeth for any reason in particular. We're doing it because it gives us an open MRI architecture. Um, it's an open scanner like this. Uh, it's from ASG Paramed. And there are three primary reasons. The first is it's um, quicker, um, kinder, as you say, clinical care. It's less claustrophobic environment and it potentially allows rapid positioning. This is what I thought when we first started doing it. Actually, it turns out the positioning is the key thing for doing these studies, getting the positioning right. It certainly would allow you more rapid positioning if you're lying down like this. Um, when you're sitting up like this, trying to fix is probably difficult. It also allows you to get new information uh, so we can study the stomach when you're sitting up. Um, we can look at the effects of movement on the spine, for instance. I'm very keen to do a study of scoliosis. So scoliosis is when your spine's curved. And at the moment, people with scoliosis have multiple x-rays during their teenage years. Multiple, not any old x-ray. Those x-ray tomograms we used to learn about when we were um, learning um, uh, medical physics when you, if you were my age. They basically do something like that to get a planar image through the spine. Um, and this uh, is obviously a preferable way to do that. So I think this is a good opportunity for the scanner. But, um, and, and in this case, it can give us new information, for instance, about lung diaphragm formation. I'll show you a bit more about that later, but some patients can't lie down if they've got lung disease. And um, this will allow us to look at the effects of gravity on their lungs and also just study them at all. But in particular, it allows us to do studies of human dynamics, which is, fits with our general interest in using MRI to study physiology and function. So this is actually from a 1.5 T Philips Supar with a very small volunteer inside, but you can do that in this scanner now, of course, if you wish. Um, so this is a GI stomach study. There's the liver, there's the uh, small bowel, and there's the stomach um, and the heart here. So this is actually one of the first studies we did on the scanner. Um, the scanner has its issues like any uh, new technology. So it's a, um, um, a permanent magnet that's it's cooled with helium cold heads, he helium free cold heads. It's got a 30 centimetre um, uh, sweet spot, so to speak. Um, the coils, the gradient coils are relatively low uh, spec compared to the sort of gradients we'd be trying to get on a conventional scanner. Um, it's got biplanar quadrature transmission, so the RF transmit coils are oops, the RF. I'm sure, I can go back. The RF transmit coils are in the plane of this magnet. Um, has a variety of received coils. I've seen a minute, and it's got a multinuclear spectrometer and reconstructor that's just been upgraded. So it's lower B0, worse SNR, uh, worse concomitant field effects. Um, the gradients only allow slow imaging, and we get eddy current and history effects potentially in the magnet. And then there's a transverse B1, which is completely different to what we normally expect in MRI. So instead of the, B, um, instead of the magnetic field going from your head to your toe, you've got magnetic field going across your body. So we need a different um, B1 array, B1 coils, and uh, we've got lower interference and lower SAR than we would have at higher fields, so that's a positive. There are quite a few coils provided with scanner, as we might expect, but um, of course, with the wide variety of ways that you can be in this scanner, you know, you can be sitting up, we've been trying to look at the um, pelvis at the moment and trying to have somebody sitting on a coil to see right underneath the pelvis, and all this sort of um, options and opportunities that this magnet prevent sense uh, means that we need to have a series of coils that's a lightweight and probably very focused on the application because 
what's become clear in the last few weeks is that you can spend a very large amount of time in the scanner getting the person positioned, getting the coils in the right place to allow you to get the measurement you want. So we're working on, um, we've got a process, of a project looking at coil design for this truck scanner, but actually the people doing that at the moment are focusing on field monitoring. Because as I said, um, the magnet, uh, there's central for interaction between the gradient coils and the magnet itself. So the, there's um, zero first and higher order spatial temporal variations in the field. That means the field is varying in time and in space, which means case space falls over a bit. So we want to be able to monitor these fields. So um, the plan at the moment, this is Paul Glover and Dependra's work, Dependra Mysteries work, and they're building a um, uh, um, basically a field camera, rather like the scope field camera. They've got plans to have, have things like flux cancellation on it to um, improve the uh, signal to noise. And um, the reason, one of the reasons we haven't just bought a scope camera is because they're not operate at uh, 0.52, you should note. And so the plan is to use this to monitor the fields during the, uh, after the um, gradients have been switched. And the ultimate goal would be to collect fields for particular sets of gradients and put them into the reconstruction, as I'll explain in a moment. We've also got some motion, optical motion camera combined with a scanner which I think is going to be essential even for head movements, even the head scanning sitting up because movement is such a problem. So related to this, half Tesla is actually quite good for um, uh, compressed sensing because the uh, random noise um, is taken out by the, the fitting, the, the reconstruction. And so we have now put compressed sensing onto the scanner, working in collaboration with the manufacturer. Well, I should say Olivier Mougan has done that work. Um, and uh, a student, Josh McTeary, has um, been working on some really interesting work, improving the undersampling and compressed sensing. So this is the variable density Poisson disk from BART. And he's been looking at optimizing the undersampling for particular conditions and looking at how generalizable this undersampling is. And it's surprisingly generalizable, actually. Um, so it's not generalizable from the Shetland phantom to a human, but it's pretty translatable from a knee to a brain. Um, and looking at optimized undersampling strategies. And then the goal is to incorporate this using um, processes that will largely uh, come out of Zurich to incorporate both field monitoring and undersampling into the reconstruction. And this is Olivier's work. <clears throat> so I introduced Luca earlier on. Um, and so uh, I'll just talk about a few of the applications of this work. So as I said, we've done the study looking at the lung, uh, the diaphragm in expiration and inspiration. Um, modeling the diaphragm as a 2D plane from this data. So it was only relatively cool to multi slice data because you need to be able to have in a breath hold and then using it to study the changes in healthies and patients between lying down and sitting up. And as you can imagine, there's changes between expiration and inspiration, of course, and there's changes between sitting and lying. And um, the changes between patients and controls weren't particularly um, massive. And then the stomach. So we're not the first people to look at this because of course, if you study the stomach with MRI, the very common criticism from uh, referees and anybody looking at the work is, well, who eats lying down? So this is work um, actually also from Zurich where there's happens to be a GI group in Zurich who looked at people upside down in the magnet <laughs> in the, trying to study their GI emptying. Clearly uh, this is not particularly, um, uh, um, um, physiological state, but they were trying to show that even if you're upside down, so this is another open scanner, this is a, a um, phonar scanner, even if you're upside down, you can still empty your stomach out. But this was for water, and we know water empties in a very particular way from the stomach. And for mixed meals, we know full well that mixed meals are very dependent on geometry, even lying down flat. We have to lie people on their sides to, to mod model the effect of being upright. So we've been looking at the stomach in the upright scanner now, um, and we've finally got haste going on the scanner because it wasn't available initially. 
we've got haste running um, at appropriate uh, level for imaging uh, stomach. We can get high resolution haste images, but actually um, what we really want is high temporal resolution haste images. This is actually an SSFP image, a uh, uh, dynamic series of SSFP images. I'm showing this because we scanned this, this volunteer um, uh, as a sort of test whilst we were setting up the sequence and I was quite confused by what was in their stomach. And eventually I said, did they eat porridge for breakfast? And this is an image of porridge. Uh, it wouldn't really sharpen the haste, which is why I'm showing the SSFP. So we can diagnose what you've eaten. Um, and you can see the contractions in their stomach here. This is somebody swallowing orange juice, so you can see the stomach filling up. So this is a study we simply couldn't do in vivo. And this is important. It might seem trivial if you're not um, particularly uh, um, interested in the stomach, but it's actually important because you can see the fluid just coming here. We just missed the slice where the esophagus enters. But you can see that as the stomach fills, it, it basically moves down into the abdomen. And what we've got here is the volume of the stomach. What we don't see what happens after this is this gas will be um, ejected from the stomach, shall we say, uh, upwards. Um, and this, this method of imaging gives us the opportunity to look at how the stomach accommodation changes with respect to the meal. And for healthy subjects, hopefully they accommodate perfectly normally, but some patients with uh, gastroparesis, which is a pretty serious condition where your stomach basically doesn't move as expected. Um, and patient, patients with other functional GI disorders, the stomach accommodation is affected. So this gives us an opportunity to study this directly without putting it, the alternative, which would be to put a barostat, a balloon into the stomach and blow it up, which is clearly going to perturb normal function. And here we're looking at the emptying of the orange juice and here we can see it in the small bowel. So we can get the small bowel motility. At, to be honest, these images are pretty good, even for 3T. We can get the small bowel motility images in the upright scanner that we currently get in the um, 3T. And this immediately throws up the question of where the peristalsis itself is altered in the small bowel when you're standing up compared to lying down. And this is something we hadn't even thought about until we saw these images. And we realized without the fluid pushing down in the pockets, maybe the function is changed. So, these images I'm showing just to show you that I haven't forgotten brains. I'm still looking at brains and this is brain images at 0.5 T. And, and this study is mainly really aimed at um, a clinical applications to look at improving um, uh, imaging in children potentially without GA and also looking at the uh, changes in the, um, the structure of the brain stem in some conditions in uh, adults. But the point really I wanted to say about this is that actually um, brain imaging is easy, uh, I think, compared to body imaging. So all of these studies that we do in the body, we have to deal with movement, um, respiration, we have to deal with the field effect change, fields changes due to that, both our B0 and B1. We have to deal with the, the effect that people are actually moving and we have to do things often in a breath hold, so we have to do things quickly. So there's lots and lots of difficulties with doing body imaging, which of course makes it really exciting if you're a, um, a physicist. So what I want to say to all you people um, doing brains, come and do some body imaging. And finally, um, uh, so in conclusion, MRI is a non-invasive physiological tool. It provides a method for studying physiological processes in real time. And uh, MRS provides you a chance to study at least some important biochemical pathways or biochemical processes, I think I should possibly say. Um, the art is designing this experiment. We use quantitative readouts most of the time, but sometimes it's fine to not be quantitative and to go for indexes if that's what's um, needed to do it in a reasonable time. And it gives us, uh, we need to have a sort of understanding of accessible, accessible biology. And um, oh, this movie stopped. Um, this movie is actually um, my other passion, which is the placenta. So this is a fetus, and this is the placenta. And um, hopefully, if I go back and come forward, um, this is what what you can see here is a placental contraction. So if you look at that placental bed, and uh, sorry, I didn't put on looping. Um, you can see that the placenta bed contracts down and the placenta is contracted. 
This wasn't known about until we started scanning these placentas dynamically with MRI. It was known that the uterus contract, the Braxton Hicks contraction, but it wasn't known that the placenta contracted. We don't yet know the function of these placenta contractions. It's quite easy to speculate about their function if you know about how the placenta operates. But um, MRI allows us to measure the flow, the oxygenation uh, through space data and the contractions to hopefully answer the question of what the function of these are. So um, uh, I'd like to um, thank lots and lots of people for working on this work. I've only named a few of them here and I thank, thank you for inviting me. Thank you so much, Professor Gordon, for this awesome talk. And we now move to this Q&A phase. And so I'd just like to remind the audience to please type your questions either in the Q&A, the chat, or just raise your hand. And while people are typing, I'll uh, use the opportunity for an ignorant question. Uh, mm -hmm. You mentioned the effect of uh, the MTC contrast at the, uh, at the bowel. And if you could please expand on, on the origin of this contrast. Uh, the MTC contrast in that case. So in that case, we are just doing a magnetization transfer experiment. We're not looking at cest. And it's known that magnetization transfer is increased in fibrosis, magnetization transfer contrast, MTC. Um, so is diffusion, uh, diffusion is changed and T2 is changed. Um, indeed, T1 is changed in the liver, it's less so in the, in the gut. Um, so we've got these three markers of fibrosis, potentially of fibrosis and inflammation. So of course we need to try and separate inflammation and fibrosis. So the goal is to try and combine the three markers or four markers actually, including T1, to try and tease apart inflammation and fibrosis markers, which is why we're quite, quite keen on CEST as a marker of collagen, because it's more precise compared to MT, which may get confused in uh, the case of um, uh, uh, edema related to fibrosis, uh, uh, um, inflammation. Great, thank you. And, and was there any particular single signal in the colon that you were looking at? Any something, something coming from other molecules or lipids maybe? In the colon contents or in the colon wall? In the colon wall, um, we're, we're, it's largely muscle, although it's uh, a really long and interesting uh, answer to that question related to fat around the colon. So one of the big questions that the um, the the medics are interested in is something called fat wrapping. So patients with um, with inflammatory bowel disease get fat around their bowel, and the fat itself is pro-inflammatory and it causes inflammation. And so trying to dis distinguish that fat that's wrapped around the colon from the fat that's in the viscera, general visceral fat is actually one of our goals. It's actually quite difficult because once you're in vivo rather than in, in an operation, it all just sort of becomes rather liquid and it's quite hard to distinguish it, but that's one of the things we're working on. You do get fat infiltration into the colon wall, but to be honest, we haven't seen that. Um, I don't think we've got enough resolution to pick that up. Thank you very much. And uh, another question out of curiosity, how, uh, how common are the open MRI system are in the UK or in general? Um, in the UK, we've got the only one, I, well, I think there's two in a university, our one, and there's one in a university that does very much um, uh, alternative medicine. They're using it for chiropractic. But apart from that, they're all in private uh, medical centres. And the same actually applies in Europe. There aren't very many of them. But I, I do suspect they're going to become more common because of the um, ability to study patients who've got, um, who've got claustrophobia, ability to study children, and frankly, the low field, so the ability to study some people with implants. And the available fields are 0 0.5 to 1.5? That's uh, no, zero, Well, ours is 0 0.5. Um, there is one that's lower field, 0.35 from a SOTI, um, but we went for field strength at the time when we got this one. In the end, we decided field strength was probably the thing we needed. Um, Great, thank you. Thank you. Just make sure if I can see any other questions at this point. Great, so I would like to thank you so much again for coming here virtually and we hope to see you next time in person, hopefully. Okay, thank you very much for inviting me. Thanks very much. Thank you very much.